Again, I want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be with you and to talk about the subjects that you've asked me to address as we talk about things that have divided the churches of Christ. As Greg has already mentioned, several have suggested that we uh, provide copies of the material, and if you'd send an email to that address that was on the screen before you, uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later in our studies. But I'm delighted that you're here on a Saturday morning to study about things that divided the church years ago that tells me something of your interest in spiritual matters and things that concern the church and things that even concern the future of the church. We're talking about divisions within the church of Christ. Uh, four lessons that we've outlined for our studies. Last evening we talked about the history of the division. This hour we want to talk about the orphan's home question that divided the church in the 1950s and then the 1960s. A little rehearsal of what we saw in our study last night. The church is divided in the 1800s over two major issues. There was the Missionary Society in 1849 and instrumental music in 1859, 10 years later, and that resulted in the formation of the Christian church and later the Disciples of Christ. But by the mid-1900s, that's 100 years later, the church was dividing again. But the division was over the sponsoring church arrangement, the orphan's home, colleges in the budget, and this, the social gospel came along a little bit later, and we'll talk about that tomorrow afternoon. The result was churches were splitting from about 1955 to 1965, and we've, we're uh, going to focus on those kinds of division in our study today. Let's go back to the 1930s for just a moment. Now, the divisions that we're going to talk about over the orphan's home is going to come about the, the late 40s and into the 50s on into the 60s. But well, let's go back to the 30s and the 40s just for a moment. There was a time when there was some controversy over premillennialism. That didn't have anything directly to do with the question of institutionalism. Roy E. Cogdell made the observation to several brethren, and his name will come up in our studies today because he fought against institutionalism. But he made an observation of the 1930s and 1940s that during the time of the premillennial controversy of the 1930s and shortly thereafter that controversy, there were many churches that rejected that false doctrine and agreed with what Roy Cogdell was teaching and Foy Wallace Jr. Foy e. Wallace Jr. fought hard against uh, premillennialism and did a great deal of teaching on the doctrine of premillennialism. They would agree that what these men were teaching was true, that is, against premillennialism, but they didn't want to tolerate the preaching that was against it. And Cogdell observed that Many of those churches that would say, you're right in what you're saying, but we don't want you coming here preaching against premillennialism. We don't need those kinds of lessons. Cogdell made the observation that when the division came in the 50s and 60s, not one of them that he knew of stood for the truth. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We agree the doctrine is wrong, but we don't want you preaching against it here. That set the, the context of a softer diet about preaching, which was a prelude to some of the apostasy that came a little bit later in the 50s and in the 60s. That's an interesting observation. Let's talk about the orphan home question. That's the most noted of the differences among churches of Christ of the 1950s and 1960s. It carried the most emotion of all the issues because you had these poor little orphans that need to be cared for, and the charge was made that those who opposed the orphan home were opposed to taking care of orphans. More about that in just a moment. And perhaps it was the most misunderstood of all the issues. If somebody was to try to characterize, here's what the issues were, and they were to try to describe the orphan home question, it was the most misunderstood of the issues of all of the division that took place. So let's talk about the history behind that. That's part of our purpose this weekend, is to give some of the historical background of the division that took place a number of years ago. Orphan's home started long before the real division. When 1950s came in, into, uh, into play, the orphans' homes had been well underway for nearly 50 years, many of them, or some of them at least. So the orphan home just didn't start, say, 1950, 1949, or something like that, but they were in existence many years before. The Tennessee Orphan Home, one of the most noted, right over here at Spring Hill, just a few miles here from Columbia, started in 1909. The Potter Orphan Home, Bowling Green, Kentucky, started in 1914. Bowles Home in Quinlan, Texas in 1924. Southern Christian Home in Moralton, Arkansas, 1926. Tipton Home in Tipton, Oklahoma, 1928. Giving you kind of an idea of, of these orphans' homes started many years before the real controversy. So in the 1920s, was there, were there orphans' homes among churches of Christ? There certainly were. Was that the raging issue of the 1920s? No, it wasn't. But these had been started and they're beginning to grow in popularity. But there was opposition to that in the 1930s. 
So this was already some controversy before the 1950s and 1960s. There was opposition to that. This is interesting. Like other innovations, it was slow to catch on. It wasn't that they started an orphan home in 1909 and then by 1912 say that every church in the nation was beginning to support that. It took a little while for that to catch on. Sound brethren fought it as they did in 1849 when the Missionary Society came in. Remember Campbell in the 1920s, we talked about, or 1820s, that he opposed the Missionary Society. But then later by 1831, he's in favor of that, just a few years later. Well, there was a name that we'll talk about for a little while this morning. We'll talk about it this after um, the next hour. Is Guyon Woods. It's an important name in the, historic, in the uh, institutional controversy. If you are familiar with all of that controversy, you're familiar with the name Guyon Woods. He opposed it in the early days. Now, that's interesting. That sounds like Campbell, who opposed it and later endorsed it. Woods became quite a proponent of the institutions and defended the church support of human institutions in numerous debates across the nation. Wrote a lot on the subject, but here's what he was saying in the 1930s. In 1939, at the Abilene Christian College Lectures, now this is interesting because this is the next year after G.C. Uh, Brewer had said at the Abilene Christian College Lectures that you ought to put the college in the budget, and if you didn't, you had the wrong preacher. Remember that last night? The next year, Woods was on the platform, and he said, The ship of Zion floundered more than once on the sandbar of institutionalism. The tendency to organize is characteristic of the age. On the theory that the end justifies the means, brethren are now scrupled to form organizations in the church to do the work the church itself was designed to do. All such organizations usurp the work of the church and are unnecessary and sinful. I couldn't have said it better, could you? Well, he was opposing human institutions being tacked onto the church to do the work of the church, and he opposed that. Well, here's another quotation. In 1946, in the annual lesson commentary, what's interesting is this was published by the Gospel Advocate we talked about last evening. They're all reliable. They were publishing this in 1946. He said, there is no place for charitable organizations in the work of the New Testament church. It is the only charitable organization that the Lord authorizes or that is needed to do the work the Lord expects His people to do. You don't need anything other than the New Testament church. Well, he changed his view on that. What interesting. Some of you who are older remember the name Marshall Patton, who stood firm for the truth. Marshall will tell you that the man who, when Marshall preached his first sermon on institutionalism, that he preached that sermon where Guy Woods was the local minister, and the man who taught him the truth and helped him get his sermon together was Guy and Woods, who taught him the truth on institutionalism. That's interesting. Here was a man who stood firm against that, but later he comes out in favor of that. Let's go back to Hardiman for a moment. Uh, N.B. Hardiman shifted the issue in 1947 from the college to the orphan home. Remember we talked last night how that they couldn't sell the college to the brethren, that is putting it in the church budget. But here was an issue they could sell to the brethren, that is the orphan home. We read this quote last evening that he said the right to contribute to one was the right to contribute to the other. And the same principle that permits one permits the other, they stand or fall together. So he shifted the issue over to the orphan's home in 1947. There was opposition to the orphan's home for a while, but he's shifting the issue over there for a while, and now the focus is, is the orphan home scriptural? And that began to be the discussion. So by the late 1940s, it's well underway that churches are supporting human institutions, that is, orphan's homes. So that spawned some debates by the 1950s. In 1954, there was a whole toddy debate. That's one of the first, if not the first debate among brethren on the subject of institutionalism. That was in Indianapolis, Indiana. There was a Harper Tent debate in Lufkin, Texas in April and November. There were two debates in 1955. 1956, W. Curtis Porter debated Guy and Woods. Now, that's the man who had opposed it before. Now he's endorsing that. He's come out on the other side. Well, in 1957, Porter and Woods met in Paragould, Arkansas. Now, this was a significant debate. This is kind of a classic that was well remembered, the Cogdell Woods debate of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, in 1957, Roy Cogdell debated Guy and Woods over that subject, large crowds for that discussion. Well, then a little bit later, the Porter met Deaver in, in Dumas, Texas. 1959, Wallace Holt in Florence, Alabama. And 1961, A.C. Grider, many of you knew, remember Brother Grider, he debated uh, Guy and Woods. What's significant about that, that debate became a turning point in the Louisville area. That debate, along with some radio preaching, turned the Louisville situation completely around. We'll talk about that in just a moment. There are a few places where that happened. 1962, Carol Sutton debated Guy Woods. That's just a sampling of many, many debates. That's just a small percentage of all the debates that happened all across the country. What, for those of you who are younger and who don't remember, and I'm, I didn't live through all of that. I was born in 1960. For, and so the, I was small in the days of the institutional controversy. 
My point is, I want you to understand the controversy that went on and the discussion that went into that. And so they had many debates of, of the 1950s and 1960s. There were journals that were published on both sides, advocating the institutions, the, the church orphans' homes, and those that were against it. Well, here were some that favored the orphans' home. And they had a distinction, and we'll talk about that in just a second. The gospel advocate we talked about last evening. That's one reason we went back into the history. The gospel advocate, the old reliable as they call it, was started to oppose the missionary society. It opposed instrumental music, these innovations. But now by the 1950s, under the leadership of B.C. Goodpasture, uh, it is now in favor of the institutions and is supporting the concept of church support of orphans' home. Firm Foundation, under the leadership and editorship of Rural Lemons, uh, favored the church sports at orphan homes, 20th Century Christian, Christian Chronicle, were some others. Well, I want you to notice the difference. Now, let me back up just for a moment. They didn't agree on how these orphans homes ought to be arranged. Uh, those under the influence of the gospel advocates said one way, and the rural lemons and the firm foundation said something entirely different. There were two different kinds of orphans homes. There were those that were organized under an eldership, such as Maud Carpenter at uh, Wichita, Kansas, Tipton, Open Home, uh, in Tipton, Oklahoma, Tipton, Open Home, Sunny Glen at, at uh, San Benito, uh, Texas, and Lubbock Children's Home in Lubbock, Texas, were all under an eldership. And that was what was favored by the firm foundation. Those that were under a board, like Tennessee Orphan Home and Bowles Home and Potter Orphan Home, Child Haven in Coleman, Alabama, were those that were favored by the gospel advocate. And they differed over how those were to be arranged. Now, it was still a, a, an institution, separate and apart from the church, it will talk about, but those brethren differed on how they ought to be arranged. Generally, you could draw a line around the Mississippi River, and those on one side of the Mississippi had one view, and those on the other side had a different view of how those orphans' homes ought to be arranged. But journals played a large part of the controversy in those days. Brethren read the journals, and there were journals that were, some of them started for the purpose of opposing institutionalism. Uh, Gospel Guardian, under the publication of uh, Roy E. Cogdell, Yader Tent was the editor, that fought hard against institutionalism. So much so that some of those who hated what they wrote would call it the gospel garbage instead of the gospel guardian. They used that terminology to talk about uh, how they dis had disdain for the gospel guardian. Truth Magazine, under the leadership of Cecil Willis, fought hard against that. Searching the Scriptures started in 1960 under Elwood Phillips. And uh, that was for the sole purpose of fighting institutionalism. The Preceptor, understandably love it, was another magazine that was fighting against that. And so brethren were reading both sides of that through those years. Now the church is divided in 1955 to 1965. Was there some division that took place prior to that? There certainly was. But the division really hit hard about 1955 to 1965. Beyond 65, the division was pretty much crystal clear. Historians say the estimate was an 80-20 split. That is, 80% went in favor of institutionalism, and 20%, the smaller group, was opposed to that. And so we as non-institutional brethren, that is, we don't support human institutions, ended up being about 20% of the larger number. So we were small in number. And that's usually the ones that pulled aside and started all over again, and a small group started a new work. I'm not sure how the churches uh, took place here in... Uh, in Columbia, but the church where I preached started in April of 61 because they split off from another group because that group was supporting human institutions, the orphans' home. And they decided we can't do that anymore, so they started a new work in favor of trying to do the things the way the Lord would have them to do. Now, there were exceptions to where there's this 80 20 split. Louisville, Kentucky, most of the churches stood for the truth under the work of uh, A.C. Grider and some others, but he was primarily the man that was responsible. Athens, Alabama, Tampa, Florida, Birmingham, Alabama were the exceptions where most of the churches in those cities stood firm for the truth, and it was only a small number that went after institutionalism. Now, there were things that got ugly and got bitter. If you didn't live through those days, or you didn't know a lot of people who could tell you about those days, it's hard for you to imagine how ugly and how bitter it got. For example, in 1954, B.C. Goodpasture issued what he called the yellow tag of quarantine against those infested aunties. That's what they called us who opposed that. Well, it's hard in our day and time of understanding what the yellow tag of quarantine was, but that you were to be quarantined and there was to be no association. And the yellow tag of quarantine was just leave those brethren who opposed us, that 20% of the brethren, just leave them alone and put the yellow tag of quarantine on them because they are the infested annies and have nothing to do with them. They tried to boycott such uh, businesses as CEI Bookstore. Don't buy any books from them because those brethren who operate that, that bookstore, 
oppose what we're doing, so don't buy any products from them. It was that kind of thing that went on in the 1950s. Robert Jackson had a knife pulled on him at Taylor Boulevard in Louisville, Kentucky. Things got bitter. Robert went there for a meeting. The elders were in favor of institutionalism and supporting institutionalism. Or some of the elders, I may put it that way, not all of the elders did. And because of Robert's presence in his preaching, one of the men asked him to meet him in the basement. He goes off into the basement with him, and with the L.L. Dukes, one of the elders who stood for the truth, went with him, and just as they pushed Robert into the room, they cut off the light, and Brother Dukes hollered, look out, Robert, he's got a knife. They pulled a knife on him. That's getting ugly. That same gospel meeting, I'm told that Brother Jackson, while he's preaching, that the women would sit in the back, clicking their heels on the wood floor, making noise, trying to drown him out. And men would take turns walking up the aisle, shouting at him, go back to Nashville. And make their way back and another one would come up. Can you imagine Greg trying to preach and someone running up the aisle, go back home, go back home. And he's trying to preach the truth. Things got ugly and got bitter. In that same meeting, someone spat on him because of his stand for the truth. Well, my understanding is Rufus Clifford had some of the same kind of thing. Someone spit upon him because of his stand for the truth. There were ads that were put out in some of the publications that were looking for a preacher. No anti needs to apply. We don't want a nanny at all. Things got uh, bitter and things got ugly. There were charged of being orphans haters. Uh, quite often the charge was made you would let an orphan starve on the doorstep of a church building before you take a dime out of the church treasury. They tried to paint pictures of, of the fact of how we hated orphans. And here are brethren who hate orphans. They wouldn't care for an orphan. They'd let an orphan starve to death before they'd feed them. And their charge was that uh, they would not take care of an orphan at all. And the truth of the matter is, there were brethren standing in line wanting to take orphans. And they, and they couldn't find enough orphans to take. Some were locked out of the buildings. There were lawsuits. I'm trying to paint a picture. If you want to know the history of what went on, things got ugly, it got bitter. Does that mean everything on both sides was, uh, was all one-sided? No, there were some attitudes wrong on both sides, I'm sure. But things got bitter, and they got ugly, and they got tense in those days. It's the picture I'm trying to paint for you. Now, who really left what? Now, this is interesting because this comes from Pepperdine University, uh, Richard Hughes of uh, Pepperdine University. As he writes a little history of what took place, his perspective was that it was those who stood against institutionalism who were standing in the footprints of the past. Now, this is interesting, he said. The mainstream churches of Christ, time and again, characterized those who opposed institutionalism as unfaithful to the heritage. The truth is that the dissenters stood squarely in one set of footprints in the 19th century churches of Christ. And by the time the battle over institution was complete, it was the mainstream, not the dissenters, that had removed itself almost entirely from its 19th century roots. I say amen. Absolutely. That was the case. Well, let's move and talk about what the issue was. That's the history behind that. What was the issue at hand? What was really taking place? Well, I want to suggest to you that the issue at hand was not should the needy be cared for. That was not the discussion over the orphan's home question. It wasn't a matter that one side said we ought to take care of the needy and another side was saying, no, we shouldn't take care of the needy. That was not the issue. The issue was not, is the church obligated to those who are needy? That was not the question at all. Furthermore, the question was not a matter of how, that is, modes, means, and methods. Quite often, those who favored institutions would argue that here those anti-brethren, as they would label us, they are arguing with us over how you take care of orphans. That wasn't the question. It wasn't a matter of modes, means, or methods. But the question was, or the issue was, a matter of, um, it was a matter of can churches build and maintain benevolent organizations through which to do their work? It was a question of a matter of a separate organization between the church and the work being done. We'll say more about that in a moment. It wasn't even a matter of a systematic arrangement or a place being maintained. It wasn't can we provide a place for orphans? That wasn't the question at all. But the question was, can churches build and maintain a separate organization between the church and the work being done, just like in the case of the Missionary Society? Now let's talk about the problems with the church support of Orphan's Home. What was the problem with that? Well, let's begin with Acts chapter 15 again. Let's go back there for the sake of those who were not here last evening. We won't spend as much time there. But I want to remind you of Acts chapter 15 and what it says about authority. The first problem with the orphan home question was this arrangement that we're talking about 
was something that was not authorized in the Scriptures. You need to be familiar with Acts 15. If you're not familiar with the fact that Acts 15 shows us that we establish authority by command, example, and necessary inference, you need to get down and study Acts chapter 15. And if you're still unfamiliar with it, sit down with somebody like Greg and, and have him to show you from Acts chapter 15 that here is how the Bible authority is established, how it was established in Acts 15, because this is the root of the concept of Bible authority. In Acts chapter 15, the question was, circumcision, is it binding? They came together not to determine the truth, but to establish from the, from the revelation of the Holy Spirit. They already knew what the truth was, but they're showing from command, example, and necessary inference. Here is God's revelation concerning the matter of circumcision. Three speeches were made. Starting with the last, James made a speech beginning at verse 13 and made an appeal to a direct statement from God from Amos 9. Then shall all the Gentiles seek his name. So he's appealing to a command or direct statement. In Acts chapter 15 and in verse 12, Paul and Barnabas an appeal to an approved apostolic example. They tell about how they went out in their missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14. They preached to Gentiles, did not require circumcision, and the miracles that were worked shows God approved of that. So here's an approved apostolic example. Verses 7 through 11, Peter appealed to the events of the household of Cornelius, and from that he infers that God made no difference between them and us. So they made an appeal to command, example, and necessary inference. That's how we establish Bible authority. Someone says that's old and out of date. It's old, not out of date, but it's as old as Acts 15. In fact, it goes back further than that if you'll go to John 13 sometime in your own study. But now in the matter of the church support of Orphan's Home, there is no command. If so, where is it? There is no approved example and there is no necessary inference. We can't find a passage anywhere that says that a church contributed to a separate organization to do the work that God gave the church to do. We can't find an example of that, nor can we find where that's implied anywhere in the Scriptures. But here's another problem with the orphan home question, and that was it was parallel to the missionary society. You remember last evening, and that's one of the reasons we spent so much time last evening talking about the missionary society. What we had in 1849 was that we had local churches all contributing to this organization that is a separate organization between the church and the work being done. Churches had an obligation to preach the gospel, but what brethren were doing under the leadership of men like Alexander Campbell was forming a separate organization between the church and the work. And what you have in the Benevolent Society is essentially the same thing. You have local churches all contributing to this Benevolent Society called an orphan home, like Tennessee Orphan Home over here at Spring Hill, Tennessee, that it in turn arranges and oversees and provides for the care of the needy. What you have is a separate organization between the church and the work being done. And a problem is not the church responsibility, nor is it that the needy need to be cared for, but the question is, where is that organization in the Scriptures that stands between the church and the work being done? That was the question at hand. But here's another problem with the, the, the uh, orphan's home arrangement. And that is that the Bible tells us the church can do its own work. Now let's turn to Acts, the sixth chapter, if you will, and I want you to understand from Acts chapter 6, many lessons can be learned but one of the lessons is the church did its own work in Acts chapter 6. Let's talk about the circumstances and the facts. Beginning at verse 1. In fact, let's go back and let's uh, read verses 1 through 6. Now, in those days when the number of disciples were multiplying, there arose a murmuring against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen. And we'll stop there for a moment because the rest of the verses simply identify the seven men that were appointed to the work. Now let's see what we just saw. Here were the facts of Acts chapter 6. There were widows that were neglected in the daily distribution of benevolence. That's the point being made in verse 1. The congregation then selected seven men to see after that, according to verse 3. The apostles then, being in leadership, appointed those seven men. Those seven men were over the business of caring for the widows. Do you notice that in verse 3? 
Therefore, brethren, seek ye out among you seven men whom we may appoint over this business. Verse 3. Now, let's talk about what happened. Here is a case where a local church is taking care of its own needy. Let's talk about what did not happen. They did not set up a separate organization between the church and the caring of the needy. So they didn't put out, let's pull out seven men and let's organize a separate organization and let's appoint Stephen as the president and let's appoint uh, the, the other men here as, uh, let's take Philip and make him the vice president and let's have a secretary and treasurer, a board of directors. And let's have this whole organization separate and apart from the church and now we will make a contribution to you all and you all in turn decide who you're going to take care of. That's not what they did. You have a case where the church took care of its own needy. Remember the quotation from Guy Woods a little bit ago? He said, in 1939 and 1946, the church was the only organization to do the work of taking care of the needy. We didn't need another organization. He's exactly right. That's what they did. By 1957, he was arguing, the church cannot do that. You've got to have a separate organization. Church can't do its own work. Well, let's go a little bit further. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 16. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16 the Apostle Paul says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged. Are you reading with me now? That it, that's the church, may relieve them that are widows indeed. Now what I saw in that verse was, here's a man or woman that has a widow. They have the responsibility to relieve them. Can they do that on their own? Well, certainly so. Do they have to set up a separate organization between the, the individual and the needy to contribute to that it might in turn decide whether or not there's need to be taken care of. No, they can take care of their own needy. Well, the any man or woman that believeth have with us, let them relieve them, that the church may not be burdened, that it, that is the church, may relieve those who are widows indeed. The church can take care of those widows indeed. Nothing about a separate organization between the church and the work being done. The very thing that some of these brethren told us couldn't be done. The church can't do that on its own. It has to have a separate organization. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, the church could do that. I want to give a passing attention just for a moment to the question of limited benevolence. The matter of limited benevolence was a secondary issue, and the question was, can the church out of its treasury help those who are non-Christians? I call that a secondary issue because that was not the dividing issue, but it was an issue. And let's put that in a historical perspective. There were men like... Brother Cogdell and uh, W. Curtis Porter and others who refused to debate that question. Porter particularly, he was urged a number of times. I've followed Brother Porter's work, though he was dead a few weeks before I was born. I followed his work carefully, and there were brethren who, who urged Brother Porter, would you make that a part of your propositions and debate the limited benevolence question? And he said no, not because he didn't believe that was an is issue, but it wasn't what was dividing brethren. Let's keep our mind focused on what was dividing us. It's that organization between the church and work being done. That's why he wouldn't debate that. But by the 60s now coming along, or late 50s and in, in the 60s, Brother Grider thought we ought to debate that, and so he did. And we don't fault him for that. I'm just simply saying he's one of the ones that brought that to the forefront and put that in his proposition, and it became more of an emotional issue. But it was a secondary issue. That was an issue that needs to be discussed. Is the church obligated to non-Christians? Well, let's answer that question. I know of new, nine New Testament passages that deal with church benevolence. Now listen to that carefully. I didn't say there were nine passages about benevolence. There are nine New Testament passages that talk about church benevolence, that is, out of the church treasury. I know of nine of those. Acts chapter 2, Acts 4, Acts 6, Acts 11, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9, and 1 Timothy 5. If you can think of another one, we'll take a look at that. I only know of those nine. Now, of those nine passages, there are some des descriptions of something equivalent to being a saint. It may say believers. It may say brethren. It may say saints, like in Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9, or widows indeed. Context will show that was a saint, child of God. Now, there is no passage that shows any kind of obligation to non-saints, which means that out of the church treasury, the church has no authority. We have no command. We have no example. We have no inference. There is no authority to take out of the church treasury and help a non-Christian. Does that mean they won't be cared for? No. That means we as individuals will care for them. But there's nothing in the New Testament about taking money out of the church treasury helping non-Christians. Now, that was a secondary issue, but it was an issue nonetheless. Let's talk about arguments that have been made to justify this question of institutionalism or church-sponsored orphans' home. 
What were some of the questions that are, or arguments that were made to justify that? Well, here was the first. And let's open our Bibles because if you're unfamiliar with these arguments, you may talk to someone and say to them, well, I understand y'all have supported these human institutions like orphans' homes, and, and where do you find that in the Scriptures? And they cite to you a passage that may on the surface seem like it says that. How do you deal with that? Well, let's talk about James 1.27. That was the favored passage of those who favored the church-sponsored orphans' home. To the point there were a few churches that advertised, like signs out on the highway, Church of Christ at such and such an address, and they put in parentheses James 1, 27. We're the church that believes in James 1 and 27. Well, I don't know of a church that didn't believe in James 1, 27. But here's what the passage says. James 1 and verse 27, James talks about visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. So the fatherless and the widows need to be visited in their affliction, the text says. Well, let's talk about that passage. That passage addresses the individual and not the church. Evidence? Let's look at the context. In the context, the passage talks about anyone. You notice that? If you haven't got your Bible open, turn to James chapter 1 and notice in verse 23. Verse 23, verse 27 is our text. Verse 23 says, If any one is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that bolds his natural face in a mirror. Look at verse 24. For he observes himself and goes away and forgets what manner of man he was. Look at verse 25. And he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work shall be blessed in what he does. Those are pronouns that refer to the individual and not to the church. Now when I come to verse 27, let's go and get verse 26 in the process. If any one among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep, are you reading with me, oneself unspotted from the world. The context is showing that the passage addresses the individual responsibility and not the church responsibility. So this passage doesn't tell me anything about what a church is to do. It tells me what I as an individual am to do. Here's what I'm to do in taking care of those who are fatherless and those who are widows. But now let's just suppose for a moment that it does apply to the church. And for argument's sake, let's grant that James 1 and verse 27 obligates the church to take care of those who are widows and orphans. This passage says not one thing about an organization between the church and the work being done, does it? It doesn't say one thing about that. So all the passage would be saying is the church has obligations to orphans. Well, then it needs to take care of orphans. And it has an obligation to widows, take care of the widows. There's not one thing about an organization between the church and the work being done. Any more than citing a passage on preaching says that we need to have an organization between the church and the preacher that's, that's preaching the gospel, like in the missionary society. I want you to notice the shifting that has taken place. We, we tried to describe last evening some shifting that took place. Here is a passage that addresses the individual, and brethren have come along and shifted that passage over to the church. Here's a passage that addresses what I as an individual am to do and what you as an individual are to do, and they've taken and shifted it over to the church, and once they saddled that passage on the church, it's not going to stay there. You know what they did? They shifted off to the benevolent organization. That's what they did. So they keep moving the responsibility down the line. They say, well, no, this passage is talking about what the church does. All right, let's saddle it on the church. And now if we all agree the church is responsible to take care of orphans and widows, they tell us then, as Guy Wood said, the church can't do that. We've got to have a separate organization over here that we contribute to, a body politic and corporate, so that it in turn begins to take care of that and we'll just support it. Woods would argue the work of the church is to furnish the money, the work of the home, the benevolent organization is to furnish the care. Well, that became interesting. Let's look at another passage. Galatians 6.10 was the secondary passage that was cited. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And in response to uh, the limited benevolence question, they would say, well, the passage says we have responsibility to all men, not just to saints, all men. And this was a passage that was cited to justify the orphan's home question. Well, let's talk about this passage. The passage addresses the individual and not the church, as we saw. And let's follow through beginning at verse 1. I want you to notice the personal pronouns found throughout the text. Beginning at verse uh, 1. Brethren, if anyone is overtaken into trespass, or if a man, there's your individual, 
is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, you might underline those in your Bible, lest you also be tempted. Is he addressing church responsibility or individual responsibility? Look at verse 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Look at verse 4. Let each one examine his own work, and then will he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse 5. For each one shall bear his own load. You see the individual? Verse 6. Let him who is taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches him. Look at verse 8. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Do we reap as a congregation or do we reap as individuals? In the day of judgment, is God going to call the College View Church and if you're in that church and everybody's ushered in, or are you going to give an account as an individual? Now look at verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity. Who's the we? The same people have been described all through the context. The individual and not the church. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Now I want you to notice also verse 12. The same ones that are told as they have opportunity, let them do good, had been constrained to be circumcised. Verse 12. Well, do you circumcise churches or individuals? Good question, isn't it? Whoever was told to do good unto all men are the same ones that some of the false teachers were trying to put pressure on them to be circumcised. Were they going to circumcise the church or the individual? But let's just agree for argument's sake that it is talking about the church. When you get through with that and all that discussion, it is talking about the individual, not the church. But let's just agree for argument's sake that this passage tells the church has responsibility unto all men. There's still not an organization between the church and the work being done. There's not an organization there. That does not justify or authorize that at all. And here's another one that's a little more interesting argument. This is not as common as the one in James 1. But this time it's in Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story well that the Good Samaritan, unlike the priest and the Levite, took care of the needy and took him to the innkeeper. And if you'll turn to Luke chapter 10, I want you to notice that when he went to the innkeeper, he told the innkeeper he'd take care of the the expenses for that, and if he knowed anything more. And in verse 35, the text says, Then the next day when he departed, he took to denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, and he said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend I, when I come, I will repay you. And so they argue from this passage that the Samaritan here gave to an organization in order to take care of this needy man. This man was in need, he gave to the organization. He gave his money to the innkeeper. That's what he did. Well, here again we have a passage talking about the individual. Uh, the Good Samaritan wasn't a church, was it? Go back and see if you see a church in Luke chapter 10. That wasn't a church. He wasn't one of the elders acting on behalf of the church. He was a Good Samaritan. By the way, he was not one of God's people. <laughs> and that's part of the point of the story. That wasn't a church. It was an individual. But be that as it may, he, what he did was merely buy a service. That's all he did. He went to the innkeeper and paid for the service. The church could do that. If we had some family in need and they needed uh, a place to stay, the church treasury could go over to the motel and pay the, the bill at the, at the motel, couldn't they? Because they have a place to stay. The house burned and, and they have no money and they have no food. They have nowhere to go. And so would the church puts them up in a motel somewhere. Would that be all right? That's the church taking care of its own needy. We're not making a contribution to an organization. We're buying a service from them. I want to tell you what, what didn't happen. What didn't happen was the Good Samaritan did not make a contribution to a benevolent organization that it in turn decided which innkeeper to use and which innkeeper not to use. That's what happens in the orphan's home. Is the churches make a contribution to this benevolent organization and it arranges and oversees and provides and decides which innkeepers to use. That's not what he did. He took his money and paid the bill over here to the innkeeper and said, if I owe you more, I'll pay you when I come back. There was no organization between him and the work that was being done. Now let's establish there is a difference between buying a service and making a contribution. Some don't understand the contrast or the, the, the difference in the two. And if we don't understand the difference in the two, then we've opened ourselves up to make contributions to anything and everything in, 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 in the nation. Let me show you what the difference is. And notice the same thing is listed on each side. Over here, we're married buying a service. Over there, we're making a contribution. Would there be anything wrong with us going to the local radio station and buying a service? What we're doing, we say, we'd like to buy this, this block of time from 8 to 8.30, this 30-minute block of time. And they say, well, that'll be 
uh, $200 for that every Sunday. And so we pay them $200. What we've done is we've bought a service from them, have we not? Well, that's a far cry from saying, you know what, we'd like to send y'all about $1,000 a month or maybe $1,500 a month for y'all to arrange and oversee and provide for the preaching of the gospel. That's a big difference, isn't it? Big difference. We might do the same thing with a newspaper, but we don't make a contribution to the newspaper. We might do that with an internet host. We might do that with a television station. We might do that with a sign company or a hospital or publishing company. We might go to the publishing company, as I assume you do. We do sometimes. We buy workbooks from them. And so here's a publishing company that's operated by brethren, and we say, we want to buy so many workbooks for our Bible classes. And so we pay them for however many workbooks. And we buy a service from them. That's a far cry from saying, we'd like to make a contribution to the publishing company so y'all have plenty of money then. Y'all can publish and distribute what you want. That makes that a missionary society then, doesn't it? There's a difference in buying a service and making a contribution there too. Another argument that was made to justify this was the church can do what the individual can do. This is our last and then we'll be done with this study. The church can do what the individual can do. Quite often throughout this controversy, you would hear brethren argue that the church can do whatever the individual can do. I don't believe they really believe that. I don't believe those brethren believe that. I had a written debate with a, a man over the limited benevolence question, and he would make that argument. And I would point out to him, there are people that you, that you think the church uh, does not have an obligation to that you think may be an individual. And I would point that out to him, and he's inconsistent in that. My point is... But they would say, whatever the individual can do, the church can do. Well, let's see if that's the case. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16, if you want to know a passage, it'll help you if this is new material, new ground for you. Go to 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16 and get this concept down in your mind, and you'll see a clear distinction in the individual and the church. If you don't see it from any other passage, you'll see it in this passage. If any man or woman that believes, here's the man or woman, the individual, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. There's the individual. And do not let the church be charged. Here was an individual doing something the church is not burdened with. Paul showed a distinction. That it, that is, the church may relieve those who are really widows, or widows indeed, the King James says. So regardless of what your concept about the passage is, you have to see a difference between a man doing that and when he does that, the church is not being burdened with that. Some have argued that when I do something as an individual, that is the church. And so when I go out and I buy a new car, then the church has bought a new car. And when I go eat lunch somewhere, then the church has gone and eat lunch. That's absurd. That means then, if that be the case, that when I relieve my widow, the church has done that. And the church is being burdened. And the church is being charged. And Paul said, don't let that happen. There is a distinction in the individual and in the church. But let's go one more time. And I want you to notice that there is a difference in how they gain their money. An individual may gain, gain their money by buying and selling. Remember James chapter 4, we go into a city and continue there for a year and buy and sell and get gain. What was condemned in the passage was not the buying and selling, but it was the presumption that there's going to be a tomorrow. And so certainly an individual could buy and they could sell and get gain. I could buy a piece of real estate on the idea that I'm going to sell it for a profit. In fact, I could buy several pieces of real estate and sell them for a profit, couldn't I? I could buy automobiles. I could set up a, a business of uh, selling automobiles and sell them for a profit. I could buy and I could sell and I could get gain. There's no Bible authority for the church to do that. The church gains its money through fr uh, free will contributions, like 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. There's a difference in the individual and in the church. So it is not true that whatever the individual does, the church may do. Well, that's our study on the matter of the orphan's home this morning. What have we seen? More could be said, but I've tried to give you the history behind it, what, what started all of that, how this grew and how it developed, how it became a, a hot controversy, how churches were dividing, what the real issue was, the problems with the church support of the orphan's home, uh, look briefly at limited benevolence, and then answering some of the arguments that were made to try to justify the church-sponsored orphan's home.